Can you hear me all right, Emily? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Awesome. You sound great. Yeah, looks good. You're ready to go. I'll just hide myself here in the background. I'll let you share your screen. Okay, awesome. Well, hello, everyone. I loved, um, I've loved so far the content, and it's been a pleasure to um, get some different insights from everybody who is here, clearly watching uh, with a lot of technical expertise. I might be the most um, different speaker today. Um, I'm trying to escape out of this real quick because I am actually a packaging design expert, and that is where I have the most amount of expertise. Um, I've been working in product development for products that are sold in grocery stores for the past 12 years, as well as online commerce. I have launched um, multiple brands also that I've been an owner of that have reached a million dollars in revenue on Amazon. Um, I've done that though quietly. They've not been my own brands. I've done them in partnership with celebrity influencers, um, with com companies like Sprouts, Aldi, Kroger. So I have a ton of experience in developing products getting them sold in stores and developing brands that um, not only sell, but build loyalty. Oh, I love it. Thank you, Derek, for posting everything. I just posted in the chat some information about me. So you're welcome and invited to add me on LinkedIn. Um, if you are interested, I'm giving away a free consult at the end of this for your product. So if you want to click to schedule a 30 minute consult on your building your brand and your business to apply anything that we just discussed. Um, you can also add me on uh, YouTube or go to my websites where I share a lot more information in depth about these topics. Um, okay, let's come back here to sharing my screen again. I'm gonna play, forgive the, here we go, share screen. And let's just play that. Is that, no, is that showing? Can you guys all see it? The screen looks perfect. Great, okay. So today the topic is seven steps to avoid basic white label packaging design. Um, and I will tell you, look, if you're on this call, you know what I'm talking about. People who are selling products on Amazon uh, are watching YouTube videos to learn how to launch products and they just look for the highest selling volume thing and they just kind of knock off everybody's stuff. We've all seen this. We've all bought products on Amazon that when it arrived looked like crap. And so we are going to talk about how to not do that so you are not going to be basic. Okay, so again, I already talked about myself. Jocko White Tea was one of my products. I won't bore you with all the other details. Go look at my LinkedIn. Um, but the main thing I want to start out is with is building the argument for why does this matter? And we've all been to, you know, seen Voss and we've all seen really cheap bottles of water in the store. This Voss bottle that I bought recently at a grocery store, I paid, um, it was like $5.99, I believe, for this glass bottle. And I paid like 59 cents for the one on the left. What is the thing that's different? They both technically contain water and I cannot prove to you that Voss is taken from the like Icelandic lands of, you know, or Switzerland. I can't prove that when I'm, when I'm ingesting that product. So literally the brand by itself is the reason why I'm willing to pay five extra dollars. And that's true of your customer as well. Um, that the more that you're able to build brand equity, it's the more you're going to um, cause people to want to pay more for your product. And there are other things that we can, we can describe as measuring success for our brand. You know, the total dollars that people will pay in the short term, there's also the long-term value of your company, because you could imagine if they buy $5 versus spending 49 cents on something today, that means tomorrow your total revenue will be so much more as well as your possible profitability. Um, Interesting enough, like customer loyalty, people buy Nike, they sell t-shirts amongst other things, but like, why would you buy a t-shirt from Nike? I guarantee you, you could buy that same similar t-shirt from Target for less. They're doing it because they believe, they perceive the value of the brand. And, you know, it's one of the most basic fundamental things that you learn in economics 101 class is that price and cost are not directly related. Um, you can technically make a 200% margin off of a product, but oftentimes it's your ability to convince other people that it's worth it that will result in sales. So, um, and then lastly, you know, the number of units that people are buying, like, oh my gosh, I need to own all the Apple products or, oh my gosh, I want to buy all of these keto chocolate products. The loyalty, the number of units you're able to sell on your store really has to do a lot with your brand mission. So when you launch a new product, is a customer going to come back and buy it again? Only if they really deeply trust that you are going to deliver. 
Then uh, lastly, some people want to sell the business. They're not just trying to create a cash flow. So if you want your business to be a portfolio that other people are going to inspect and want to pay money for, I guarantee you, I have, besides doing pearl resourcing, I offer business consulting. I have helped people to build a portfolio that they could sell for multiple millions of dollars. I've helped people to build um, arguments and cases to be able to get cash infusions from venture capital companies. I guarantee you that if you don't have an established, beautiful looking brand, people will not want to buy it. It's like trying to sell a Ferrari with like a bad paint job. If you truly want to get the most out of that sale, go get those like dings on your Ferrari fixed before you go and sell it. Um, I also want to point out that, I mean, obviously we all know that Amazon is like a gargantuous company which is filled with private label sellers, but I would argue that premium is also growing. And so it's, there's a decline in discount. So even if you think your, your position is a value position, people actually are, they have so many options. They're going to buy the thing that looks the best as a premium um, positioning. So I'm saying that brand building is actually in your best interest of your short and long-term profitability of your business. And so what are those best practices? Let's go through seven that are, I'm gonna focus on the mistakes and then I'll tell you what the solutions are. So this is a screenshot from a random brand in the charcoal category and I love the way this looks because this is a great example of someone who just did a private label situation and they slapped a label on it, put probably as little money as possible um, this is called a me too product where it's like, oh, I'm searching online and I'm found that there's a high sales volume in this particular category. I'm going to do it too. And so people rush in, you know, and there's, that's like really infamous for Amazon sellers, especially, and they just knock it off. They take exactly the same packaging, the same product, and they just put a different label on it. And that's totally okay. Like I'm not judging or hating on you for doing that. That's the best way to start your business. Um, wow, the lights are motion censored. So I'm sorry, they're turning off. It's going to make for a more dramatic presentation. Um, but so brand, these are brand equivalents. These are any kind of knockoffs. Here's your issue. We all learned this in economics 101 is that you are a perfect competition when you don't have any kind of barrier to entry. And your brand is actually a type of fence that you can create to protect your product uh, where people can't just steal your customers if they know who you are and what you do. So I would say your best interest is to avoid the price war um, because if you knock someone else off, someone else can knock you off too. So it may be working now, but eventually the algorithms are going to change. Amazon can very quickly, for example, knock off all the private label suppliers and force you to meet certain criteria. And I've worked with people who are doing that because they're just, some people are taking advantage of the system and, and shipping crappy product. And so it's going to change as this whole system continues to evolve. And so the best security you can do is to create a non me too product. So what is the solution to create a unique brand story that builds trust? So what, you know, how would we define that you're going to be unique. You want to be intentional, transparent. You want to focus on the benefits to the consumer. You want to indicate with your brand that you're there for the long haul. Like this brand could go here tomorrow. I have no idea whether or not they're trustworthy enviro supply <laughs> but if you have if you have a invested money into a brand you subliminally are telling to customers hey i'm here for the long run hey i'm intentional transparent i have superior quality if i put money into the outside branding of my product i probably put money into the product because it's a more superior thing it, it would take profit this is literally how it works. People realize if you have profit, you invest it into your product. If you're broke, this person is clearly broke and doesn't care. <laughs> so this, by just investing into a brand, you're gonna speak subliminally to your customers about your quality. That's how you would build um, trust and eventually create more profit. And so, um, you know, what from, from my perspective, and I, this is my goal is to argue to you, that you build a brand that like, what is a brand? It is the visual cues that consistently, uh, that you use consistently that allow people to access ideas. This is why it matters because the back part of your brain is associated, which forms right in, in utero, like before you're even born, that's the visual, like light sound, like primary elements of your brain. So when you, when you or a customer sees something, the first things we notice is the size of something and the color. Um, and so, and then after that, you, you start to identify um, other like shapes and then symbols and then text. 
That's the order with which your brain recognizes things. And so visually, that's the most powerful way you can communicate to someone when they're looking at packaging. Um, and you want those visual things to be associated with who you are, because if they feel something or think something about your company quickly with pictures, which then they are going to take action towards it. So it's going to speed up the call to action, which is to buy. So we apply that to packaging. Um, Gosh, this is so difficult to move my, my, if you guys can't read what I'm saying, I can't see anything in the chat right now. So, um, I don't know, like, let me All see. All is good. Can... All is good. Okay. Derek, you just, you chime in if something is off. Okay. So, um, how do you do this? How do you build a brand? You need to start with your why. Cause again, you want to create visual elements that communicate thoughts and feelings uh, that are going to motivate them to action. So your packaging artwork should start with why. So if you are sitting there and you're like, Hey, you know, my portfolio is actually kind of lacking. I, I did a great job building a business, but I need to get to the next level. Come back to your why talk about what does my, who is my customer? What are their goals and values, their needs? And then how are we going to assess that? So you can know, you could write that whole thing out. You've done all this data analytics to identify who your target customer is. Then on the left-hand side, write out like, why are they looking for a product like this? If you're selling online, people are not um, going to a fixed location, like a grocery store where they only have 10 options for cookies. They are going there and they're typing in cookies into a search bar. And they're probably looking for keto cookies or chocolate cookies. So there's key things that they're looking for when they are searching for your product and given what their needs and searching their desires are, how are you going to clearly fulfill those? So write those on the opposite end of this chart. And then once you've identified the macro level, high level elements of your brand, then you need to assign visual cues to them. So it's like one-to-one -one relationship, chocolate, what picture will communicate chocolate? We're talking about keto. What image are you going to repeatedly use to associate yourself with keto. And then you, so to build that brand, you basically put all of those things to find. So it's like your logos, your fonts, your key colors, patterns, imagery, um, call out colors. You want to collect them into one place. And I recommend we call that a brand guide. So you have one place where all of the key elements are there. And that way, whenever you're drafting lifestyle photos, Instagram pages, your Shopify page, new packaging artwork, sales presentations for retail, all of that stuff will be in one place so that you can come back to it as a guide to hold yourself accountable. So again, I recommend making a brand guide. Your next mistake that I most often see is that designers this is like their first business or they've been doing business for a while and they are the ones who are driving the design within their business. And if you are awesome at analytics, Bravo to you, but I would bet you money. You may not be the most stylish dude or chick out there. And people who are graphic designers and are experts in this category are, should be the ones advising you how to generate sales. You know, you should tell them the objective. You should tell them all of these key elements about your um, customer. They should tell you how to accomplish those goals. So most people are either trying to do something cool. So they grab an image that they like a brand, they send it to the designer and tell them copy this, or they go really super cheap and it shows. So the solution to that is that you need to write a five-year plan for your business. What is, are the product portfolios that could possibly happen in the future? And you need to start designing with a very long-term goal and you need to rely on your graphic design team to help advise on how to increase conversions. So, um, and you want to make sure that everything is consistently focused on sales, not just your personal opinion of what's cool or your short-term goal to save money. And you want to make sure that's consistent as you apply things and you continue to grow. So don't just design, like, don't just grab random images, send them to your designer, say like, Hey, do this, do this. Then you're going to have 10 products that don't make sense or tell a story and your business's brand value will not be as strong. The next mistake I see people make is that labels have no color because for some reason, people who are analytical seem to be much more all about organization, clean, like simple colors, like black, blue, gray. The problem is that again, color is the first thing that grabs attention on um, when I'm searching for things. So, and I'll show you that later, we're going to get into um, evaluating the search platform, but color is actually the best way to grab attention. So in a sea of same colors, you want to look for the color that would be the outlier. 
And that means, so in the macro level, look for the color that will be an outlier and use color to grab attention. Even if you don't like the color purple, maybe that's the color that will work in that category. So use color as a part of your strategy within your bigger picture brand. And then within the packaging artwork, the best way to make sure certain call outs work for you and actually grab attention. If you do blue on blue, do you think I'm going to know which, which when I'm prioritizing what to read on your picture on Shopify or on Amazon, I won't know what to read. So you want to make something big and you want to make it have a contrasting color for me to want to notice it. And a basic color wheel, you just pick the color on the opposite end. So, you know, you don't, you could use purple and yellow to create a sharp contrast and I would be drawn and attracted to the yellow, which is the brighter color. Um, so you can, you, you don't have to use annoying primary colors. This is Pearl Resourcing's colors. You can tell I've got a very like fun, wild and crazy um, color block, color palette. But these are examples on the right hand side of how you'd use opposite colors applied to your brand to make things stand out. If you want to read more about it, my blog, Start to Sold. So it's emilyannpage.com backslash start to sold has an article on color blocking strategies. This one is specifically focused on retail, but it applies to um, online commerce. It just is about how to do packaging design. So go check that out. This is... Um, picked kind of like a boring, you know, brand in terms of like, it's very reliable brand and their branding matches that, but they utilize color, not just, um, you know, with a consistent logo and the placement of that color, but they use colors to help draw attention to their, um, different flavors. So there's other ways you can use color to help your customers identify your product and know what it is that they're buying. The next mistake I see is that designs are done without considering where they're going to be placed on the shelf. So, I guarantee you that the last design that you did is that you had your designer do it and you looked at the packaging artwork on your computer without anything else there on the page. So yeah, maybe it looks cool on your design on your computer, but how is it going to look when it's actually being sold in stores? So you can see here, um, like charcoal pills here. Like what my question to you this is how you do it is you go and you take a picture where you're going to place the product. So if you're selling on walmart.com, amazon.com, even your own website, especially in any place where you're competing with other brands, but it still applies it within your own shop online commerce page, take a picture and then look at the picture, not at the actual thing. Like what is the first thing that stands out? So I would ask that to you. I'd be curious to have a response in the chat, which, you know, on the left-hand side is a candy category, which brand stands out the most? Ask yourself that, look at it real quick. What is grabbing your attention? And I guarantee you it's the color for most people. It's the color that grabs attention. Um, on the right hand side, we can see activated charcoal, like which brand out of these grabs your attention. I'd love to, Ooh, I love it. People are putting in the comments. Very cool. Um, and what does that mean for you? That means that if you are trying to compete in that category, you should do this screenshot and then open it there and then have your designer do a smaller version of your logo and have them place it on this picture. So if I, like, if, let's say I did this charcoal um, at the one by Bulletproof, I love that brand. I know it's a sponsored um, product, but again, like I'm talking about the actual color, put your picture on that picture, like a mock-up and see, does my product actually grab attention? And so that's the macro level. And on a micro level, which words stand out the most? It's funny to me, you know, I'd be curious to see what you guys have to say, but like, on um, coconut charcoal, the bulletproof one, like I just love bulletproof brand in general, just cause I like the guy. Uh, I like his podcast. I can't read his coconut charcoal. So that might be a cool brand um, thing, but the, the text that I can read is the pink and black bottle activated charcoal. That font is super simple to read. So I love it <laughs> for that reason. And if I could just go give a call to bulletproof um, Dave Asprey, who he should be my friend if he doesn't if he's on this, this video watching this today, just, he should be my friend. Um, that's a, but he needs to revise that font because it's not working for, for him. Oh, the other thing I'm going to say is that also pictures should be as large as possible within the square. And you can see that black bottle with pink is really optimizing that. Like the bottle is filling as much of the, the predetermined square that they have. It's filling every single space. And you want to do that too, to maximize the chance that you're going to be seen versus having your uh, mock-up really small in the square. So you'll do that by the solution of designing, uh, planning for your placement, taking pictures of where you'll place the product. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So here, here it is. These are just other examples. This is a picture of me at a store where you can see that they've used color to really grab attention at an end cap. Um, 
Here's my next mistake. They use too many call outs and words. And when we're designing packaging for retail, it's a completely different animal than if you're designing packaging for online commerce. Because as you can see from these mock-ups, I can't even read any of the text. Um, it's important to have complexity in your design because if, it, if there's not a lot of complexity, people think you're not a real brand because we're so used to a busy packaging design, like as though you've got a lot to tell us, but it can't be, you can't expect anyone to read it. Even when I, when I go to that, um, the listing page, when I, zoom, I have to zoom in to read the text. So you want to rely on um, just a few primary, maximum three callouts, like um, that are important just to the customer when they actually receive and unbox the product. But it's really only one primary call out that people will be able to read, like activated charcoal, non-fat. So you have to pick one and stick to it and then use an accent color to make it stand out. Um, and then rely on lifestyle photos in your product listing page to get more information to the customer. This is the advantage you have over like in-store retailers is that you have lots of information, uh, places you can share the information of the product. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Oh, these are just examples of companies that have done this. I, I do a lot of, you know, again, like work with really large brands. So this is Rayleigh's and you can just see that like, they don't have a lot of call outs. It's one of the reasons why it's really simple to read even though you're not up close to that product. Um, how much time do I have left? Derek? You've got 11 minutes, so you're well, you're good on time. Okay, uh, the next thing is that most people pick the structure of their packaging based on what your co-packer gives you. And this is really true of um, people who are doing private label, like white labeling, real quick stuff. You just do what the factory is making you do. That's awesome for your starting like initial thing. I totally recommend that. Oh, I should say here to save you money. Um, oh no, I'm going to say that later. I'm going to say that part later. But so um, I would recommend the solution is that you pick structure based on, um, I didn't change this, but your solution is to pick packaging based on what will best serve your customer and what will really help you to build your brand in the long run. So for example, the things you um, need to think about is obviously like maximizing the shipping space. So you can maximize the box and minimize the per unit cost to ship something. So for example, you could design packaging um, in a bulk pack or in a larger pack so that you're actually filling, giving the value, filling the entire box. Um, another thing you could do is like, consider how you're going to build your brand. You know, if you're having a janky, a janky bag or a janky bottle with a janky label. People are not going to in the long term respect <laughs> your business. Like it doesn't look like you care about your product. So why should they care about you and your brand? Um, so you might want to pick something, go and actually search for some type of structural packaging that would really serve you and help you to build your brand. And the ways that, like the things you need to worry about and think about, you could read um, Designing E-Commerce Packaging to be Indestructible um, on my Start to Sold page. And I talk about like, how do you actually design it so that when you're shipping it, it's not going to break. We've done a lot of that um, for people. Um, but when you're coming to try to change your packaging, you want to think about the determined um, intended use. So that includes, you know, whether it's going to be, needs to be liquid, dry, or frozen, whether it's sold in retail, um, whether it's your own Shopify page. So you're doing your pick and pack or it's Amazon. So it's clustered with everything like that can determine breakability of your product. You know, the shipping weight fees are different on each platform. Amazon's super transparent about that stuff. If you have your own pick and pack, you know, it can be really complicated, I know. So you want to use someone, someone needs to sit down and do the math if you have high volume shipping to see how can you design your packaging to minimize your costs. Um, yeah, so, and I mean, like reusability of your product for your specific brand of the individual cell unit is also really interesting to think about. Like, do I want to make something that someone's going to keep on my desk? So they continually think about me and my company. Here's how you do this. This is how you scale up the structure. You know, you start with, this is the cheapest way to do it. You start with stock packaging. Okay. You start with what the company will give you easily. And then you only customize the label and the high, highest ROI is actually investing real money in the branding. So the branding and packaging label, the design, the visual elements. If you are at the beginning stages, don't spend money on custom structure, just pick the label and, and focus on the artwork. But after you've proven this concept, the next cheapest way to do it is to make custom packaging for the whole brand and only customize the printing on the label. So that means like, for example, pouches, you buy 10 pouches with your brand on it, like coffee bags do, Starbucks coffee bags, and then have a label be something that's custom across different flavors. 
You're going to have it like, so that way you're able to invest your big investment into one thing. Like I had to buy 10,000 stand-up pouches. Okay. That's a, it might be an investment for you. Maybe that was like $6,000. And then you also have to do labels. Um, but that will still show that you are a, like a brand that invests in yourself and therefore people will remember you. So then after you've done that and you know, wow, like everyone's buying different flavors, I really need different packaging for each flavor or each SKU. Then you invest in custom, you know, packaging per um, variation. So that's the first way to scale up affordably. The steps are you research your options. This should be number one instead of four. Uh, research options uh, like on the internet, okay? Find stock packaging companies, find custom packaging companies. Um, we do sourcing for people if you want someone to help you. Um, discuss with your manufacturer the cost implications because it's not just going to be the cost per unit, but also sometimes your contract manufacturer who's filling the box might charge you more money for the labor involved. So ask about the implications. Get samples, test things a million times in shipping. Make sure you're clear on the cost implications, even of the shipping stuff. So how will this affect the weight? How will it affect like whether it fits in the box, all this stuff? Um, how do you make sure that these designs are right for you? Get physical mock-ups. Like you have to get physical mock-ups, put them inside of store shelves or put them into fake mock-ups of Amazon and see how it goes. Um, just be sure that you test other things you want to think about is recyclability, um, testing for everyday use. Like if it's a resealable bag, is it really resealable or is the top zipper at the very top not going to work? Because a lot of like factories in Asia might ship you a bag that looks like it works, but it may not fully. So you have to test it and hold your factory accountable to make sure that they're going to do a good job. If it's a resealable, reusable product, how will this uh, affect shelf life? Because that needs to change your packaging artwork or your call outs to your customer. So be sure that you just test everything um, test it in Amazon, all that stuff. <laughs> and make sure that your structure isn't so different that people don't know what it is. Uh, this is an example of oil at the very top. You know, obviously the white bottle is still an oil it impl implied by the structure, but people have natural associations with structure. Um, so like if you're doing a makeup line, it, it, you might not want to put a lotion in a weird palette because people may not buy it just because it looks different. If they don't know your brand very well, they may not be interested in it. So sometimes you want to be a little bit similar in the very beginning of building your brand. So people, um, if they trust you, they'll buy something different, but if not, then it needs to look kind of similar. Lots of different options in terms of material. People forget about wood, ceramic, folding carton, paper, plastic. Um, but lots of different unique ways that you can make your brand stand out structurally. Um, another way that you can get different is by considering multiple serving sizes. So, I mean, there are companies that have transformed the entire stinking world just by looking at doing a different size. Justin's peanut butter namely broke into a retired, like old category, which is peanut butter, just by putting their peanut butter into a pouch because they thought about their customers. So using the structure can be a great source of innovation where you don't change the formulation of the product but you change the application of the packaging, how it's being used. And so I highly recommend in, if you're like a, if you're ready to take over the world and your brand is positioned for that, that's a great way to do it. People don't think about this should say number seven, bad product photos. So that's, this is the last place when people are searching for your product packaging is actually only experienced when people unbox they're shopping for you. Their shopping shelf, the retail shelf is the online commerce search page, right? So if you have dark lighting, faraway photos that don't fill the entire space, then people cannot see your product. And so my tip is to um, use high-end mock-ups, which actually we have found perform better than photos. So if you have not yet had someone do a mock-up, you know, have someone do it. If you're going to do a photo, just make sure that it's professionally cleaned up so that the colors are enhanced and that you can read its legibility of what the product is. When it comes to these mock-ups and photos, make sure that what it, what's inside is really large and it's larger and easier to read than even your brand. And this is way, way true for online commerce companies because people are looking at a tiny little mock-up and they can't see in the search field what that product is. And if they've never heard of you before and they're searching for like fish food, I better know that that's fish food and my, and your logo is not important to me. I don't, I don't care that you showed up in the search field. I'm going to look and scan for fish food based on the brightest color and the largest text. So if you want to really close sales, that's the best way to do it. Um, Derek, how am I on time? Uh, you got a couple of minutes, no rush okay. though. Okay. Okay. Um, so here are some things that like just regularly go wrong is like a lot of people forget about, um, you know, the fact that your colors that are, um, 
like the photos that people send to you may not be accurate with what you actually get. Um, so make sure that you double check photos of the products that you're going to get off colors. So the colors you design on a computer screen are not the same when they're printed. So there's a whole science behind it and you have to go into the Pantone PMS color, color guidebook to get it. And any professional designer would know about it and you can search and Google about it. But the point is check your colors. Don't use cheap materials because they're going to rip. You are shipping products. And so you might feel like, oh, I can save a dollar by having thinner material or thinner corrugate, but you need to test it before you just go cheaper because you can have um, breakage and that will make you lose way more money than you saved buying that product. And you want to work with a factory that's reliable too. Like this one, just there's a temptation to price compare and say, oh, that one's cheaper. That one's more expensive. I'm going to go with the cheaper company, but they may not um, guarantee their product. They may not ship you really high quality. They may not be as safe and reliable. So you just don't want to go based on just price. You need quality to be able to protect your assets and investment. Think about shelf life on how long the product's going to last when it's in shipping. It really applies mostly to food and medicines. Um, innovation takes time and it takes costs. So do it, plan it in the long run. Inefficiencies for co-packers, co most people forget the fact that when you change your packaging, it changes how that factory is going to fill the box or apply it. So it might be a really cool, complicated packaging, but there's going to be labor uh, costs applied to it. Totally might be worth it, but just think about it because it's something often people forget. Other challenges to overcome, import tariffs. So if you're importing packaging, um, like for example, ribbon, if you import ribbon by itself, there's a wild ribbon tariff, but if you attach it to a box, it's not that expensive. So you want to think about tariffs and plan them to reduce your costs. You want to, yeah, creating molds, you want to consult with someone because there's a fee to have some custom glass, for example, or metal created. Um, and you want to think about sustainability. We're all in a world where packaging is too much. And so people oftentimes will respect a strategic choice where you're choosing to be sustainable. Like we chose this paper box because it's sustainable. Sometimes that is a selling point just by itself. Um, yeah. So, I mean, in, in summary, there's like seven different mistakes that I basically mentioned that you want to avoid. And rather than go through them all one more time, because we don't have much time, I do want to just share with you that if you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to me. You can add me on LinkedIn. Um, Pearl Resourcing is my company that does branding and packaging design. So we do it for both online commerce and retail. So we have a ton. Not only do we give you advice on the visual elements, structural elements, but also we can manufacture and deliver that packaging for you if you need any help. And also we can help advise you on creating like optimized Amazon listing product photos or sales sheets. Let's say you're ready to get into retail. We can help you advise you on all that stuff. Um, alternatively, I also do consulting. So if you have a business and you're like, Emily, I got it on lock when it comes to like my designer, but I'm not sure what to do for myself. What, what should I do as a physical product brand business owner? I want to get to a million dollars. I want to sell my business in the future. I, are, I want to improve our packaging and you want someone to talk to who is an experienced executive, go visit emilyannpage.com. Um, if you are like, hey, I'm not really into talking to anybody right now. I just want some free information. Um, I have my blog start to sold, which is at my website. I also have a YouTube channel where you can watch videos and I talk about different topics, like how do you get into retail? How do you protect the intellectual property from your contract manufacturer? Um, you know, how do you get, what are the three tips for the best shelf life, a packaging to improve shelf life? So you can go and subscribe there. And I'm just welcome everyone to reach out via social media. I've got Instagram and Twitter and all these things, but LinkedIn is my main primary place that I am. So come say hi. Awesome. Love it. I've shared all the links here. I'll get the LinkedIn uh, link in just a second. Um, that was mind blowing. And I think a lot of people here are rethinking their packaging right now. So if you're interested in having a consultation with Emily, definitely go to her website, talk to her. She will get you squared away going in the right direction. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Emily. We're going to move right into our next session.